Hi, I'm Zivy Owens, and I am the host of this podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I am also a newly minted USA Today bestselling author of the novel, Blank. I've created a whole community of book lovers around this podcast, a publishing company, reading retreats, a bookstore, and more. Learn more at zivymedia.com or follow me on social at Zivy Owens or join the community at Zivy Readers. Liz McNichol is also back on the podcast, this time for I'm Mostly Here to Enjoy Myself, One Woman's Pursuit of Pleasure in Paris. Her previous memoir, which we talked about on this podcast, is No One Tells You This. It was named one of the best books of 2018 by Esquire, the Financial Times, and the CBC, and was a 2019 New York Times paperback row pick. McNichol hosted and produced Wilder, a reckoning with the legacy of Laura Ingalls Wilder for iHeartMedia. It was an official Tribeca Festival 2023 selection. In 2021, she co-produced and story edited iHeartMedia's Under the Influence podcast, hosted by Joe Piazza. It has been named to multiple best of lists. She has written for The New York Times, The Guardian, The Cut, New York Daily News, Town & Country, The Daily Beast, Jen, and Elle, among others. Welcome, Glennis. Thank you so much for coming back on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This time, I'm you, your book is I'm mostly here to enjoy myself. One woman's pursuit of pleasure in Paris. Congratulations. I didn't realize until you held it up, I kind of matched my shirt to the... You did. Yeah, unintentional. feigning ignorance of this, but really, it was totally planned. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. And listeners, Glen- Glennis was just reminding me, we first talked about her last book six years ago, which seems physically impossible to me because yeah. it just does, but Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Well, I was so excited when you originally told me you were writing a new book, then to get your new book. And I was like, oh, yay. And it's so good. I think you were really one of the first people I showed the cover to. I think I was at a book event Yep. at your home, at home and yes. I only just received it, like received final approval on it, showing you in your kitchen while I was eating your delicious appetizers, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> and the cover is amazing. The whole thing. The thing I really loved is that you talk about stuff that people probably should be saying and talking about, but you say it in a new way so that we all kind of understand ourselves more, which is what is so powerful to get out of a book. And you like hit the nail on the head. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I'm happy to hear it. I think, uh, it, I mean, the having the book go out in the world is always an interest, as I'm sure you know, like what you think you've written and what people experience sometimes aligns really closely. And you're like, oh, great. And sometimes people come back and they're like, it feels like not in a bad way, but you're like, oh, I didn't know that necessarily know that that was there. But now that you have, you know, experienced that version of it, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear it. So there's definitely a lot of different I joke that the book is about Paris, sex, and cheese, and it is. But it, in addition to that, <laughs> it is about a number of other things. So it's always an interesting sort of like Rorschach test on where people are in their own lives to be like, to hear what, they, what they're what they getting out of it. So as it's going out to the world, it's been, you know, interesting, you know, it's so great. What, so what is your elevator pitch? My elevator pitch, which I've gotten better at, is the book is about five weeks I spent in Paris in August of 2021 after more than a year of being very, very alone in my little New York apartment, which you can see behind me. I stayed in New York during COVID, and which was fine, and I'm, I'm glad that I did. But at, at sort of, it's one of those things where you don't realize how difficult something has been until you sort of reach the end end of it. Mm -hmm. And that summer, it all sort of blurs together. But that summer, as you remember, the vaccines came out and people were sort of starting to emerge from their homes in New York. And I was like, oh my goodness, I have not, when I say I wasn't touched, I mean like touched, like as touched, but also just like literally touched. Like, you know, I was, my building had emptied out. I lived by myself. It was really rather extreme. And then I got on a plane and I went to Paris and I just, I was thought, I am going to hurl myself into every pleasurable thing I encounter. (laughs) And I'm fortunate that I have a group of friends there because I've spent time there over the years. And Paris is a place that does prioritize pleasure. You know, I think 
even in that moment. And then everyone there was having the same experience. So it was just sort of like a, a hedonistic five weeks. And when I got back, I kept thinking like, we don't have very many stories that prioritize women's pleasure simply as deserving in and of itself. And we don't have a lot of stories for women where the pleasure is not tied directly to, you know, pursuit of marriage or pursuit of parenthood, both of which are great plots. But I was like, I would just want something that just exists as like, you know what, go and have a good time. And also I was 46 turning 47 that summer. I turned 50 at the end of this summer. And I thought we definitely don't have stories about women in so-called middle age who are just where everything is enjoyable as opposed to, I think the message we often get is like, it's just going to get worse. Your body is changing and like, you're not attractive and, and it's not so exciting. And I'm like, your body is changing. (laughs) And yet, you know, your body has always been changing as a woman. And so I really just wanted to be like, Oh, I want everyone else to know that this is possible. That's less of an, that's a long elevator ride, but that, uh, that is how I would describe the book. We, we took the, um, Eiffel Tower ride here. All the way to the top, baby. <laughs> oh, well, I love that. And I love how you start off by telling us, like, after how difficult and crazy the lockdown was for you, that even something as simple as the flight and the traffic were easy. And I love that. You're like, there was nobody even sitting next to me. And I could just lay out. And then there was no traffic here. And, like, as someone who, like, obsesses over logistics, I was like, no way. 25 minutes to Kennedy? No. How did she do that? <laughs> when I wrote that down, I was like, I, don't, I maybe a guy friend of mine, I said, I don't think you understand for women. Like, just everything going <laughs> yes. right is, like almost pornographic and like it's just like oh my god because I would tell because I was so mesmerized by it like there was no traffic to JFK there was like everything went right and I was so dazzling to me that when I was telling my friends about it like the reaction on their faces is similar to the your tone right now and I'm like this is just this is people need to know about this (laughs) people need to know what it's like when everything goes right for you as a woman because again I don't know that we really you're so, especially women on the move and when you're traveling, you're so keyed to be like, is it safe? Is it this? And those are all valid questions. But I was like, what happens when like, it all goes well? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it's a great sort of preamble to all the other things in the book yeah. that goes, <laughs> that go well. How did you feel about, well, first of all, the level of detail is great. Did, were you keeping a journal the whole time? Like, how did you, you took the whole time? So not the whole time. Cause as I, detail detail somewhat in the book I occupied myself yes. but I do I do keep I have kept a journal since I was six years old which I still have and so it's sort of like a normal thing to just journal and one of the reasons this turned into a book is I I had when I returned and I was back in New York I'd gone into my journal to look for some detail or some name and I started rereading it and I was like oh this is great <laughs> <laughs> Which is one of the reasons the book is in present tense, because I thought, oh, I just, I don't want this to be like, oh, this happened in the past. I just wanted like the experience that I had of rereading my own journal of like, oh, you're sort of dropped into it again and living along with it. Mm. So yeah, some of those, many of those details are really pulled somewhat directly from my own journals. And then, you know, the longer passages of me sort of thinking out loud or pulling on history or, or context are definitely aspects of the book that came into it as I was writing the actual book. Yeah, I I appreciated like the tour of Paris also. I'm like, I didn't even know this about all these parks. And like, now I need to yeah. go find this other park. And like, <laughs> I've been in the wrong place. What have I been doing? <laughs> it's such a, I'm so glad I like captured it too. It, for myself, when I think about it, because Paris now is packed again, even almost more than it was pre-COVID. Much as you know, like New York feels very filled to the brim. And I was so grateful that I'd had enough time in Paris prior to COVID to have some understanding of the city so that when it was empty, it was so empty that summer I was there, that's in this book, that I could really appreciate the the emptiness of it. And now it is like empty Paris is a fantasy. It's so full of people again. So even I, when I read it, sometimes I'm like, oh, that was great. (laughs) It's just great to like zoom up to a park. And that was like, the streets were empty. So you should set up like a little 
you know, roadside stand in Paris when the Olympics come through this summer and just be like, no, no, it was empty. Look, this is <laughs> going to be nuts this summer. I was just there last month and even the construction is really crazy right now. So I am grateful that I like inadvertently, this wasn't, I wasn't attempting to sort of, because when I sold the book, I still think that we all were a little uncertain of what things were going to look like. And so I'm just in, in hindsight now, sort of with the awareness of where we are right now in terms of travel and et cetera. I'm like, I'm so glad I got all this down because it does feel like a fairly, like I just captured something that was rare, you know, for all of us. Yeah. It was a short time, but yeah, there's something magical about an empty city really. Yeah. Let's talk about the, the down and dirty of the, <laughs> of the book. Okay. Do you not get embarrassed, right? Like I get embarrassed even like talking, reading, I'm blushed, but like, do you not or do you, but you plow through and put it out there anyway? I will tell you when I, there is a not insignificant amount of sex in this book, which I felt was important because it was a key component of that summer. But also I think because so much of the messaging directed towards women my age is like, oh, you're no longer, you've lost your attractiveness. You are, have you reached the point where you're invisible? Like, can you ever expect to have sex again, essentially? <laughs> like I just felt, and so because it was such the opposite, it was just like another example of the gaslighting around narratives around women in their bodies and age. And, and I, and which was a little bit what I touched on the last book, but no. So when I, I really, when I did the first draft, and you know this, like first drafts, you're sort of huddled in this very, even if it's not literally like this, like you're in a very safe space with mm -hmm. no input and you can sort of just convince yourself like, oh, I'm just writing this in my diary and mm -hmm. like, let me get all the details down, which I did. And I sort of thought, oh my God, this is horrific. And so then I, I compelled myself to hand it over to my editor, Amy Sun, who I love. And, and she was very encouraging. And by the time, though, the book gets to this point, I think the desire to write well, to write a good story, to make sure that I'm providing the experience that I want the reader to have outweighs any self-consciousness of, I can't believe I'm quite literally revealing myself in this way. You know what I mean? Like, and that, that instinct, the fear of having bad storytelling or bad writing is is much stronger than the fear of, you know, shame or not even just shame, like embarrassment. By the time it gets to this point, it's seen, it's been seen by so many eyes and you are sort of the book. And I don't know if you had this experience too, but by the time you get to the point where it's almost published, it's almost like, we don't have children, but like you're putting it out into the world. You have sort of like relinquished, it exists as its own thing, separate from you almost. Like I'm obviously still connected to it and attached to it. <laughs> And, but it's like, it, it sort of becomes its own thing away from you. So I, when I went to do the audio book last month, I did go in thinking, how oh, is this going to be like? <laughs> and my audio book producer was so wonderful. And what we just had such a good time reading it. And at the end of it, I was like, ah, I probably could have put in a little bit more sex. I just, <laughs> was like, I, I had enough distance from it where I was like, ah, oh, this sounds great. <laughs> like, Where's I would the sequel? Stop, exactly. I would stop and go. You know, he really was very enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I think, I, but it definitely was, it was definitely like I made a promise and then delivering on the promise in the beginning felt a little, like I was anxious about it. And then, you know, you just keep going, you know, you, you have, you just sort of keep going because you, you want it to be a good book. I will say, so we, uh, friends of mine, friends of mine who are in the book have all read it obviously before it, like over the drafts, but people who've read it will come back to me and say like, actually, I think the, the pornography for lack of a better word is around the food. Or I think mm. that the pleasure in it is around, you know, the bike ride, or I think, so it's very interesting. And there's plenty of people who are like, no, I love the sex. <laughs> so, but it's really interesting. I think women, how women experience pleasure again, is not something that we talk about to any at any great length. And so the assumption is that we experience pleasure the way men do. Like it's all about nudity and mm. sex. But in fact, I really think there's some people that like, oh, it's the friendships that I found the most pleasurable part of the book. And I think it's really, it's been interesting to me 
again, when I say like people come back with different impressions, it's been interesting to me to be like, oh, I assumed this would be the part everyone thought was the like, oh, I can't get enough. But in fact, it turns out that I am better at writing food descriptions than I thought. Or it turns <laughs> out like everybody wants to eat the brunch with the five butters and the and yeah. the, all of the sugar, whatever it is. So that's that's where I sort of made a mental note to dial back on my like, this is a book about sex because it really is a book about pleasure is the truth. And sex is one component of the pleasure. But honestly, it's also, I think, a love letter to my bike and a number of my friendships. So it's like it... it, it it's a it's a it's a true escape, right? You're yes. escaping. You're taking us to another life altogether and another city, the city that people dream about going to, yeah. doing the things people can only dream about, eating the things. Do you know what I mean? Like it's the whole thing yeah. is like aspirational, and mm-hmm. the pleasure in the reader is just getting to go along the ride with you, right? Oh, that nice. like like the the arc from isolation and you know where you have giant water bugs and like rats and talons and I'm like what the heck (laughs) right I was like I I remember one point my editor said something about water bugs and I was like oh I need to explain to people who don't live in New York the water bugs like Like, water bugs yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) but it's not yeah I do think I mean I think for everyone lockdown was the most extreme version of our life choices whatever those life choices were, you know, it was, oh, I like being married to this person, but do I want to be married to them this, <laughs> this much? Oh, I adore my children, but do I need, do I want to be <laughs> with them as much as I'm with them? Or in my case, I'm like, I love my life, but oh my God, this is like the most extreme version of being alone. It was like, and it, I think for all of us in different ways, it was like that, but. Trying to see if I dug eared it or not. But when when you were like, people kept coming up to me and being like, I hate my kids. <laughs> I, I laughed out loud. I, I'm glad you did because it really, and I think to have that feeling towards your children is such a nightmare. So people would come and sort of like walk around socially distanced the park with me and like say it like a confession. And I was like, just so you know, like you're like the fifth person in two weeks. <laughs> I understand the difference between you are in a really hard, hard place right now and that you actually hate your children. Like there's a, there's a, there's a, that we don't allow women to experience necessarily that gray area of like, oh my God, I hate my kids. Yes, because this is an extreme, extreme experience. But yeah, I do think women tell me that. Parents tell me that because I don't have kids and just like an, <laughs> an assumption that there's not going to be like a lack of judgment. I've turned it into like the confessional booth. But it's also helpful that so many people do it because I can be like, it's completely normal. <laughs> you know, you're not alone. <laughs> I mean, in a way, the book is like the ultimate bounce back for all of us, right? Mm-hmm. We all need that and we need the distance to see how far we've even come from since there which doesn't feel like that long ago and you do that in a way like i don't necessarily you know quote if someone said like do you want to read a book about covid but like this is not a book about covid at all it's about the aftermath and life and like i don't think like if you had taken this trip 5 years ago it wouldn't be landing the same way with readers no. you know they'd be like okay that, yeah glad you had fun yeah, exactly <laughs> Precisely. I do think that we, I mean, there, I do think culturally you're seeing this sort of, especially in America, because, you know, there's lots of things wrong with France. I don't like to idealize places too much. And Paris exists, you know, as an idea for all of us. And then there's a reality to Paris. And in this book, I, I got both at the same time, which was such a gift. But I do think America in particular is post COVID is a little bit like, why aren't we having more fun? Like, why aren't we, why aren't we enjoying ourselves more? You know, like, wait, cheese sounds good. Like vacation, you know, and I, and you can sort of feel it percolating in the air. And I didn't want to write, I really just wanted there to be an enjoyable story. I, I, do you, I don't remember, no, remember during COVID, like, I would go on Twitter and people would be like, I'm taking this opportunity to read Tolstoy, War and Peace, or Anna Karenina. And I was like, oh my God, all I want to do is watch the party scene and Breakfast at Tiffany's. Like, like yeah. so I just wanted, like, obviously we're not living in a world right now where there's a ton of happy news. And I just thought, like, let's just have like a little small 
just little party slide into it. Yeah. Like just sort of luxuriate in a little small thing. Because I do think in ex- the experience of joy is resilience, truly. Yes. And like this idea that they don't coexist is not related to humanity or reality or how you manage to get through difficulties. And so but also during that moment, I kid you not, I really did feel like I landed in Paris and like people were just like, how quickly can I take my clothes off? Like there was, just, <laughs> it was like, cause they had a much stricter lockdown than we did. I mean, New York was really tough, but Paris had also had a strict lockdown. And so they were just, it did feel like the timing of my landing there in my sort of <laughs> state really aligned with the state of <laughs> <laughs> It was just like, it was a little bit of a Roman, you know, the Romans and the Roman baths hedonism happening. But I think that celebration of connection is what life is all about. And that's what you're doing is saying like, I tried it without any human connection and it it was terrible. And yes, of course, we all value our privacy and our time alone. But like, this is like so fundamental to who we are that I'm going to show you what it's like when I go all in on that. And That's what we, that's kind of what we all need in the aftermath, yeah. right? Yeah. So. Connect, I mean, not just the aftermath of COVID. I just think the fact that we're sitting here on Zoom, you know, like the fact that there's a I significant know, so part of our lives that have like transitioned to not real life and combine that with the COVID experience, it's like you need to be in community, in real life community. Like the the physicality of being close to, to somebody just even across a dinner table is yep. so fundamental to how we exist. And, mm-hmm. and being reminded of that that summer has stuck with me. I really do my best to like, I joke these days, I'm like, I'll come to the opening event. Like I just like to seeing people in real life still, even though we're four years out now or three years out from the worst of it, still, it just still feels like there's like, a craving, like Mm -hmm. a a real life craving, I guess. Someone just sent around an article on Instagram last night or something, which came out, but I missed it. It came out a month or two ago, but just about the rise of attendance in like all sorts of events, right? Like literary events and salons and, you know, these random like dinner things that people are hosting everywhere. Just like people are out and they're like, whoosh. So, yeah. Which is you good. Just want to touch, like I, like li- quite literally. I'm just like, oh, I'll never, never get enough hugs now. Like I just, you know, oh. like I, I want to like pull holiday. apart the Zoom and like let you <laughs> into my room. I feel so I bad. Feel like my arm around yeah. you, like run. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's wild to, and and also I think gives you some tiny measure of insight into what you know, isolated people. Yes like isolated by age or circumstance mm-hmm. or, you know, isolation is punishment. It is truly punishing. And it, yes. and I live on the Upper West Side, which the population is ages, oh, the, the age average is a little higher. But, and I, I really do think that like when I'm at the post office and you see sort of older people standing there chatting away with the post person and you're like, oh, for God's sake, get a move on it. But then I really think like it can be very, like the isolation of age sometimes for some people is so hard. And so it really made me think a lot more about isol and loneliness because I'm mm-hmm. never lonely. And I think we have really, you know, troubling narratives around what who loneliness attaches itself to and like the circumstances and this idea of, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm you're a lonely person if you don't partner up or whatever it is. And I just think, oh, I don't actually think that has anything to do with it. But loneliness is brutal. Mm-hmm. And isolation is brutal, actually. You know, isolation. Yeah. It's true. Did you hear that in some grocery stores now, they're they're going to have an aisle for older people who just want to talk and check out slowly? Oh, that's no. Sweet. Love that. I'm getting in that aisle. <laughs> I, 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 COVID, I became the person at the post office being like, and then, and I thought, oh, this is how it happens. This I can see. I got like a preview into yeah. you know, just from circumstance. Oh, I love that. That my, is my mom told me by the way, like my stepdad, he'll just like go hang out at the post office for a couple hours. He's like, Yeah, just like to check it out, say hi to all the guys, you know. He like puts a chair outside the post office and just hangs out. Yeah. It's adorable. Absolutely. Anyway, Glennis, so great. Great. It was so fun even just to like yeah, be yeah, in your talking. writing head voice, you know, all <laughs> the stuff again. So I'm a fan and it was great. And congratulations. Oh, thank you for having me and thank you for reading the book. And mm-hmm. uh, 
really fun. I hope so uh, cool. hope to do this again before six more years. So you yeah, better no kidding, get right? to it. <laughs> Go to another city and see what they have to offer. Exactly. Oh yeah, take us, <laughs> take us with you. <laughs> All right. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. If you love it, please leave a review and follow us on social at Zibby Owens and at Zibby Readers. 